Welcome to the Rock of Grace podcast, where we are leading people to follow Jesus together. You can find us online at rockofgrace.org, and we're also available on Apple TV and Roku TV. We pray that God speaks to your heart today. This sermon is, is, is ultra simple, all right? You guys, who's okay with simple, right? All right, here we go. It's got like one point. You ready? Ready? Jesus came to redeem his creation, and he came as a child. All right? Because he came because he's creator. He wanted to redeem his creation. But he came as a child to teach us what humility is like. So I want to tell you a story. This story is found in Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Yes, this is Christmas. Yes, we're going to talk about the Christmas story. But I want to fast forward. I felt the Holy Spirit kind of just say, you know what, look at, look at the end of Luke chapter 2 here, and look what happens. He explains, Jesus tells us why he came. So imagine with me, Jesus is 12 years old, all right? He's approaching puberty. His voice is just beginning to change. Joe is buying him a new pair of shoes every couple months because he's growing out of shoes really fast. And if you have a teenager, see a couple of you do, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Well, he and his parents, Mary and Joseph, are on their yearly trip to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. So they did this every single year. It's tradition. Every year at Passover marked another year when Joseph was growing from boyhood to manhood. But this time was different. At the age of 12, this year would be unlike any other little vacation to Jerusalem that they experienced before. So the party was over. The festival is over. The wine is all drunk. Everyone has packed up their bags, and they're wanting to head home. You know, dads, like all dads, say, let's get up early. We're not going to make any stops, right? We're going to hit it. We're going to hit traffic. We're going hit to the, hit the road before the camel, you know, traffic at 9 o'clock hits. We want to get on the road. Let's go. Honey, do we got everything? Yes. Do you got everything? Yeah. Do you, do you have this? Do you have that? Yeah. Do you have Jesus? Yeah, we got Jesus. I'm sure he's in the group. This is a big group. He's always with us. You know, like he's with, he's with us. So you got it. Let's go. So they, Joseph, Mary, and the entire family, and it says acquaintances, they hit the road, and they left Jesus home alone. I just thought I'd throw that in there. You'll get that pun later, if, or if you read your Bibles, you get it now. But no, I'm kidding. They went on a full day's journey back to where they lived, 12 hours minimum. Think about it. Full day's journey. Full day's journey. So imagine you go to South Carolina from Ohio, right, or even further. So you drive 12 hours. And then something hits you. Joseph and Mary are talking. And Joseph comes up to Mary and he realizes, you know what? Zachariah's been talking my ear off all day long with, with that whole, you know, being mute for nine months. He's trying to get every story out that he ever knew and all its details. So he's talking my ear off. He's one of those travel companions, right? And uh, then he's like, you know, what? I better just go check. Let's just, let's just double check that Jesus is with us. So Joe starts asking around. Uh, have you seen Jesus? Have you seen, he's with us, right? No, I haven't seen him. Have you seen Jesus? I haven't seen him. And he's getting further and further towards the back of the pack. And he's, have you seen Jesus? No, I, I haven't seen Jesus. And all of a sudden, it hits them. They left him at the hotel. This is not good. The feeling of every parent's worst nightmare hits them. How many of you are a parent? You know what I'm talking about. I've had this feeling twice with Two lost children. It's terrible. Joseph, I heard that. Joseph starts asking, I, I, I lost my child. And he, he's freaking out. And he comes to Mary, right? You have to picture this. I mean, I encourage you when you read the Bible to, to picture it. Okay? Can you imagine? He comes up to Mary. Mary, Mary, um, we, uh, we left something in Jerusalem a full day ago. We left, we left Jesus. What? What do you mean you left Jesus? No, we left Jesus. There's no me. Can you imagine? Like, he's Emmanuel. His name is God with us, and he's not with us. What are you talking about? Like, what do you mean you left Emmanuel? He's at the hotel. <laughs> we got to go back. So they had a full day's journey back, but the problem is they get to the hotel, and he's not there. They go to all the 
all the tables at the banquet, everywhere the festival was, he's not there. They looked for three days. There was no Amber Alert they could just send to their iPhones, okay? There's no Facebook posts. There's no Google. Three days. They walked house to house, business to business, synagogue to synagogue, looking for Jesus. Finally, they find him in a synagogue. They walk in the back and picture this. He's teaching and he's reading the scrolls with the Pharisees and the other Jewish boys. He's 12 years old. But on top of that, it's not like a normal yeshiva moment where these Jewish boys learn from their rabbis. He's talking to them and he's explaining the text to them. And they walk in and they see this. Now, by the way, can I just interject? Have you ever been left somewhere by your parents? My parents left me at church, alone, in the dark, three times. Did I mention alone? I remember my little, my cute little face against the window. Sarah McLaughlin was playing in the background. <laughs> I was also left at the airport. Yeah, yeah. Been talking to Dr. Phil every week since. I was left at the airport. Only when I was left at the airport, when my parents realized that they're in the car and they're going home and they realize, oh my gosh, we left our son at the airport. I was also about this age, but when they found me, I wasn't seated, you know, with pilots and stewardess and the Jamba Juice lady explaining the scriptures to them. I was in a pile of tears, right? I was in a pile of tears. So Jesus is not some other kid. He's not like the other Kids, it says they were amazed at his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said, son, why have you treated us like this? In other words, your dad and I have been worried sick. Have you ever found your kid and you're like, I'm going to kill you? And you're like, I mean, I'm so glad you're here. Right? You're so conflicted. You're mad at him, but you're so glad you found him. And he says, why were you looking for me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? Can you imagine that? Joe's like, I am your father. <laughs> right? Can you imagine Joe and Mary look at each other? They don't say a word. Because in that moment, they realize, it says they were completely perplexed. Imagine they look at each other, and they realize maybe he's just now discovering who he is. I mean, it all flashes, be it all flashes between their, their, their eyes, right? They're, they're looking at each other, and they realize 12 years ago, shepherds came, wise men came, bowed down, giving gifts, all these prophecies. The angel had told them who he was, and it was like all of a sudden they realized he's discovering who he is. He's discovering why he came. Can you imagine that moment? And listen to verse 51. And Jesus went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. So, he said, so, so they said, hey, son, where have you been? You know, you have us worried sick. And he's like, okay, I'll go with you. Can you imagine, by the way, if your kids obeyed that fast? Like, if I want to go somewhere at 8, I have to tell them to get in the van at 7.50. I factor in 10 minutes. 10 minutes of disobedience. I factor it in. I factor in 10 minutes of putting on coats, taking them off, peeing, going, you know, again, getting the coats on again. And Jesus just went. I found that to be so beautiful that he was submitted to his parents. You realize he made them. Right? He made them. He created them. Yet he was willing to be submitted to them like a child. And that's the heart of the whole message. Don't miss that. I don't know, I, I, I've read the gospel so many times and I, 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 that so stood out to me this week. And he was submissive to his parents. So Jesus was not only childlike and submissive to his heavenly father, but he was submissive to Joseph and Mary. Wow. He had this little blimp of, of time in the highlight reel where they felt, you know, that he disobeyed and he should have been with them. But to him, it was this conflict, right? Because... He's in his father's house. He was doing what he knew he was supposed to do. All of a sudden, he was coming into his own. Yet when they said, no, you need to be with us, he said, okay, yeah, I'm submitted to you. Jesus was totally submitted to his earthly parents, two people he created. 
So before we jump into the storyline, you've got to realize who he is. This is the creator. This is the son of God who was fully man, fully, or not fully man, but fully grown God, right? Seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven for all time. And was willing to leave that to come to us. Again, Jesus is first and foremost our creator. If you cannot believe Jesus to be creator, then you will have a really hard time believing him to be anything else. If you believe Jesus to be creator, you can easily believe him to also be the one who can supernaturally save you. Amen? Heal you in anything else. Jesus was childlike. Why did Jesus come? This is what we're going to talk about the next four weeks. We're going to talk about how he came. And I want to tell you this. How he came unlocks to us the mystery of how we come to him. How he came to us unlocks the mystery of how we must come to him. You guys doing okay? Luke 19.10 says it like this. Jesus said, this is later as as an adult, he says, the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. That's why he came. So what was lost? We were lost. Intimacy with God. Oneness with creation. Creator and creator being one. That intimacy, that friendship was lost. So God started to intervene, right? God started to intervene. God intervened and started over with Noah and his family. God intervened and he spoke to Abraham and he said, listen, beginning with you, I'm going to create a new people completely dedicated to me. It'll be just like it was with the garden. Me and you, I'll be your friend, Abraham. Abraham was known as a friend of God, right? So God had his people, his prized possession, Israel, set apart for him. God raised up Joseph as a type of Christ. Again, God intervened and gave a message to mankind. We discussed this two weeks ago. Then Israelites are enslaved to Egypt with a new Pharaoh that comes up next who does not respect Joseph. God intervenes again and meets uh, with Moses. God comes as a burning bush, as a thundering voice. And then God came as a still small voice. And God was revealing himself and his message to man. Moses has this encounter with God, set my people free. You know Moses does it. He steps out in faith. Miracles follow. Fast forward a few hundred years, we've got these judges helping guide God's people. They demand a king, right? God gives them Saul. God removes Saul's uh, anointing from disobedience. God gives them David. And young David serves with integrity and honor, and he loves God. He's a worshiper of God. In fact, it says he was a man after God's own heart. In fact, Jesus was called a son of David, and that he would reign on David's throne. The way David reigned, Jesus would reign. David reigned with compassion and with uh, clarity and victories. So often David would prophesy about this Jesus that was to come, what we call at Christmas, what we call Christmas, right? Right? David would prophesy. We read one of those prophecies last week where David says, At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You protect me in your presence. This, the Psalms that we read last week, he was speaking of Jesus, the coming Messiah. So Jesus comes to us in so many ways, but never had he come like this. Again, he came through the prophets. He came through a burning bush. He came through water separating He came through these powerful demonstrations of supernatural interventions, but never had he come in the form of a human, let alone a baby. The weakest form, the most dependent form of a human. Before he came, there was silence. There was years of no God moments. Years. In fact, they got used to the silence. They got used, they got complacent. They started to, there was so many, think about generations going on without encounters with God. And pretty soon they're telling their kids, well, yeah, you know, there used to be uh, people that God split the ocean for us and we were delivered from Egypt. And then this happened and this happened. And all this was being passed down through oral tradition. But you got to realize when you have decades of silence, People started to really doubt if God was real, right? Silence. But then what broke through the silence was not 
It was not this big thundering voice from heaven. It wasn't water split. It wasn't water coming out of a rock. It wasn't a burning bush. It was this quiet star sitting over a little town, the little town prophesied about, that out of you, Bethlehem, will come a ruler, right? And there's this quiet little star, this little still small voice of a message and the sound of a baby beginning to cry. So again, why did Jesus come? And why did he come in the form of a baby? He came to give us hope to redeem his creation, to buy back the sons of man, C.S. Lewis, as C.S. Lewis would uh, word it, to wrong right, to forgive us of every right, and to teach us to forgive one another. How many still are learning that lesson, to give grace to others? So this is where God intervenes in the story, again, of mankind, but he intervenes like no one expected. Jesus came as a baby, the weakest form. So dependent. You know how dependent children are? Okay, so my children, when I say, hey, let's get in the van, like I talked about a minute ago, you know, and it takes that 10 minutes. If I say that they don't think, did, did I get gas? Did I, did I fill up the tank? Are, are the tires full of air? Did I pay the car insurance this month? Should I call Allstate? They don't think any of that. They just get in the car. Well, after a couple kicks, no. Right? When you, parents, when you, or grandparents, when you say, come to the table to eat, they're like, they're not like, I don't know if I went shopping. How many kids do that? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be like a little miracle? They actually, yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> Sometimes I actually do. I just want to give my kids the keys. Like, go ahead. We're missing milk. Just go to the door. No. Right? But how many parents know what I'm talking about? They're completely dependent. On, they completely trust that you have food. Right? It's not a blimp on their radar that they should contribute at all. I don't expect them to. I don't expect them to. Don't get me wrong. I'm not like, you know, you're five. You should start pulling your weight around here. Like, I'm, not, I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying they're completely dependent. They're completely dependent. Jesus came completely dependent on the Father. Completely dependent, listen to this, upon two flawed human beings. He came completely dependent. I mean, if, if, it, was my, if it was me, like I said in first service, I would have just showed up like a general coming out of like the desert, you know? And I would have had like 10,000 angels, you know, disguised as like soldiers. I'd be like, yeah, here to take over. You know what I mean? Ray, wouldn't you do it like that? Pretty much, right? Okay. But that's not what Jesus did. How many realize he could have done that? But he didn't. He came as a child to teach us that we, if we're to come to him, we too must come as a child. He talked about it a lot. In fact, turn in your Bibles to um, Luke 9. He knew why he was coming. As you're turning there, he knew why he was coming. He came to seek and to save the lost. As you're turning there, I want to tell you a little secret. What the disciples did here is an ongoing problem. Adrian, you'll, have, you'll probably have this problem, even with some of the Bible school students. They put their worldly philosophy and filter through which they view life over the gospel. So Jesus is constantly trying to teach them to humble themselves and show, you know, realize your need for God. And this is what it says. An argument rose among them as to which was the greatest. So they're arguing. Who's the greatest? The greatest of all time. By Jesus. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning in their hearts, he took a child and he put him by his side. So imagine this. Jesus is holding this like seven-year-old boy. And he says, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Whoever receives him also receives him who sent me. The least among you is the one who is great. He's like, you got to be like this child. And then he says this. and Can you imagine? They're sitting there vying for position. Well, I'm... 
I'm the greatest. Can you imagine Peter? Peter's like, look, I walked on water. Did you walk on water? I didn't walk on, you know, you didn't walk, I walked on water. Right? They're vying. If you're wondering if they still struggle with this, in the Gospel of John, he's ending the Gospel, right? And he's John. He's John. And he writes, Peter and John headed for the tomb. Peter started first, but the other disciple got there faster. He's speaking of himself. He's like, I just want to throw it in there that I run faster than Peter. Like, talk about immaturity. <laughs> pastor Josh, you've never dealt with that with teenagers, I'm sure. As a youth pastor, you never, right? Okay. These guys struggled with this immaturity. I mean, remember the times when Jesus is like, how long do I have to put up with you guys? Right? What if we said that on a Sunday? I would never say that. <laughs> how long do I have to put up with you? No. But think about that. They're vying for position, and Jesus is like, if you want to be great, be like this kid. Welcome this kid. Welcome this kid into your home. Learn from him. And, and they're sitting there like, we are like the, the 12 great. Now, I thought this next passage, I thought this next passage was uh, always like separated, but it's not. I thought it was like, you know, maybe the next day. But I think it's the exact same moment. Listen to this. John, John speaks up. Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. He's not in the in crowd. He's not assemblies. He's not assemblies of God, Jesus. I don't know if he's legit. And Jesus says to him, do not stop him. The one who is not against you is for you. I mean, think about it. Adrian, he just told them, be like a child. And John's like, yeah, yeah, good sermon illustration. I get it. You had the kid sitting there. That was really powerful. He spoke to me. But the bottom line is, Jesus, you know, the, we, the, us 12, we're like your chosen ones. And that guy over there is delivering people from demons, speak, preaching the truth of Jesus. Don't you think, you know, we tried to stop them, but people were getting set free. Can you believe that? And Jesus is like, yeah, that's the mission. It's not about you. Right? He's like, that's why I came. And they're like, oh, man, I blew it again. Anybody ever blown it? Like you totally just. To show you a couple other moments where he speaks about this, just go one chapter more. Luke 10, verse 21. In that same hour, he rejoiced with the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Look at the way Matthew 19, uh, Matthew words it in Matthew 19, verse 13 through 15. Then children were brought to him that he might lie, lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked them, but Jesus said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For such belongs the kingdom of heaven. So there's the children. He's like, look, you can learn from them. Be like them. And they're like, no, no, no. We're astute. We were once fishermen. But now we're like you. By the way, this still happens. I've been in a number of green rooms before the event. Where I'm like, I can't even believe these are Christians, let alone ministers talking right now. This happens. People lay their carnal perception of like who's greater and who's less over the gospel. It's not the gospel. The gospel is we are all children. We are all children. We are all completely dependent upon him. Let's go back to that moment when Jesus is speaking to them he's preaching again now he's older he's preaching again he's about to enter his ministry skip to uh go to luke 4 all right this is just the next chapter over in luke we read about earlier read luke chapter 3 now we're in 4 jesus is older now he returned in the power of the spirit and a report about jesus went throughout the surrounding country that he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all so people were looking up to him in the way he was teaching 
And he came to Nazareth where he had been grown up, as was his custom. He went to the synagogue, so he went to church on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. By the way, do you think that was coincidence? Do you think it was coincidence that they gave him Isaiah? Have you guys ever heard the term mic drop? You're about to see like the, the most epic, like the, the initial mic drop. This is a scroll drop, right? Listen to this. He says this. And he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given him. He unrolled the scroll, found the place where it was written in verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set liberty to all those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, set it down, and then sat down. Can you imagine that? He, he stands he reads this, and they look at him, and he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Can you imagine sitting there? They've read that passage before, but nobody has ever read it and said, today this is fulfilled. They've read it for decades. Decades they've read that. And he says, today this is fulfilled. Now here's the crazy thing. When the glory of God is revealed, the childlike see it. But those who are already spiritual in their own eyes don't see it. They were so blinded by their self-imposed, self-version of righteousness that they drove him out of church, drove him to a cliff, and were trying to push him off for blasphemy, and he miraculously escaped through the crowd. Only the childlike will discover who Jesus is. Now, I used to read this, and I got to tell you, I don't know that I fully really understood that portion until this last week. I was reading again. I always will read through the text over and over. Then I'm going to preach on it and say, Holy Spirit, am I missing something? Am I missing something? And here's what I realized. If you read this and you think, oh, yeah, Jesus came, you know, for the down and out. You know, Jesus came for the poor, just like Matthew Five says he's a sermon on the mount, and he says, you know, blessed are you because you're poor, blessing you for your mourning. You're not going to mourn anymore. There will be no more crying. So it's like Jesus came for poor and sad captives. No, no, no. He came for all because we are all poor. We are all captives. We are all blind. Right? Right? This is why he says it like this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. You have to realize that you are captive to your sinful nature. What we talked about the last three weeks, you have to realize that you needed saved to see that you, that, to be saved. It has to start from a place of God revealing to you, you need saved. Revealing to you that you are captive, that you are poor, that you are blind, that you are oppressed. Listen, men, it doesn't matter how much money you make, how strong you are. Women, it doesn't matter how beautiful you are or how smart you are. You are blind, oppressed, poor, and captive until you let Jesus set you free. That's what that passage means. And Jesus is saying, that's who I am. That's why I came. And they're thinking, you're, you're, you're just the son of a carpenter. I'm not going to learn from you. This is why Jesus, God, this is why God in his wisdom hid the glory of Christ in this man. A child of a carpenter. You know how many liberties America has given you or your job has given you. You are a captive, a slave to sin until you let Jesus save you. Women, no matter how beautiful you are, you need Jesus to save you. Men, no matter how strong you are, you need Jesus to save you. Humility is the only prerequisite to salvation. 
Admitting your need. Admitting your need. You must come to him as a child to receive Christ, the newborn king. The way he came to us unlocks the mystery of how we must come to him. Childlike. Before Jesus, we are all blind captives. For those of you that still might be skeptical, I see, I see a number of visitors here today. Can I tell you just one little sign? There was a lot, and I, I, could, I can't, you know, you can't preach for like three hours, right? I didn't even know we'd like to. Um, one little sign. Just one little sign of God, how he slipped it in to humanity. Do you know the name Yahweh? Those four letters actually translate as breath and breath. So in, in your very breathing, you are confessing the reality of God. Think about that. And Yahweh, Yahweh, you're breathing. You're actually just breathing. You're confessing the name of God. Even an atheist, when he says there is no God, he is confessing God while he's saying there is no God. There are so many things in Scripture that reveal to us the reality of God. And he hides it in the person of Christ. And only those willing to humble themselves will see him for all his beauty. And here's the really another crazy part to all this. It's an ongoing mystery. It's an, Jesus is this ongoing. The word of God is ongoing. How many of you ever read the Bible and you're like, how did I not see that before, right? How? It's, it's, it's alive. The Holy Spirit illuminates the Word, and the Word is Jesus. We read that in John 1.14, right? The Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us. I wanna, again, I want to close this with thought. Like I said, it's like one-point sermon. How Jesus came to us unlocks how we must come to Him. If you're already mature, if you already got your act together, you don't need God, at least so you think. But if you'll humble yourself, if you'll stop comparing yourselves one to another, you'll find so much joy in just being a child of God. And can I tell you, if you're missing out on joy in your life, maybe it's time to be childlike again. I want to say that again. If you're missing out on some joy in your life, maybe it's time to put aside some facades. Maybe, maybe be childlike again. Maybe learn to just laugh at yourself and realize you do not have it all together. Talk to your kids or your spouse. They'll tell you. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Can you stand up with me? I just want to give you an opportunity. If you could bow your heads. Every week we like to give an opportunity for people to receive Jesus. He came in grace and truth. John 1.14. It's one of my favorite verses. He's the complete, the, the visible image of the invisible God. He is truth. He is perfect truth. Yet he doesn't come to lord over you and to, and to domineer you and to make you. No, he comes to love you. He comes to reveal Father God's love to you. And if you don't believe me, please just look at this one concept. He was willing to come as a child. He was willing to come as a child. And the way you receive him is to approach him as a child. Even if you say, no, well, I, I'm kind of set in my ways. I'm about 50, I'm 55 now. You know, you're trying to convince me, Jordan, that no, 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 listen. I'm not trying, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Jesus came to set you free. He came to set the blind free, the captives free, to restore sight to the blind, to give joy to the oppressed. So if you're standing here, don't be stuck. Don't let pride make you stuck 
Say, well, I don't need joy in my life. Yes, you do need joy. If you're telling yourself that right now, you need joy. That's your sign, actually, that you need joy. I want to encourage you to listen to the Holy Spirit's prompt. If he's prompting your heart and your heart's starting to beat maybe a little faster, and you're starting to think, I need this Jesus that we're talking about all day. If you need to let Jesus, the Son of God, be your Savior, if you realize today that you are blind without Him, that you are a captive without Him, would you raise your hand? It will be the greatest decision of your entire life, the most important decision. Amen. Anybody else? Praise God. Anybody else? Again, this is the most important decision. This is the most important, more than any... Any other decision you will make as a person on this plan is this moment. Will I surrender my life to God and realize that he is creator and sent Jesus to redeem me? He created me and he wants me as his own. If that's you, would you raise your hand and give you one more chance? Can we make this prayer all together with this young lady? Can we all say this together? Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for being my father, for, for righting every wrong, teaching me what love is, teaching me how to forgive by forgiving me. Help me realize today that I am a dependent, helpless child in need of you. Be my heavenly father. Adopt me into your family. Make me one of your own. I give my life to follow you. Teach me, Holy Spirit, how to follow Jesus for the rest of my life until I see him on that day. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Can we praise God for a life transformed? Come on, praise God, all the angels in heaven. Can I encourage you with this as you leave today? Make it a point this coming Christmas season to just be childlike, okay? To, to just be like a child. Look at the person next to you and say, Hey, child, just look at it. Just say, hey, child. Right? Because these are your brothers and sisters, and you all live in the same house. Although that might be kind of crazy, but you know what I'm saying, metaphorically. Amen? All right, have a great week.